Welcome to the Federalist Society's virtual event. This afternoon, October 11th, we discuss HUD and the disparate impact rule. My name is Evelyn Hildebrand, and I'm an Associate Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Today, we are fortunate to have Mr. Devin Westhill, who will moderate conversation this afternoon. We were hoping to have two speakers, but Mr. Morgan Williams has been unfortunately unable to join. Uh, Mr. Westhill will introduce our speaker, and I will introduce him now briefly. Devin Westhill is the President and General Counsel of the Center for Equal Opportunity. Immediately prior to his selection as President and General Counsel of CEO, Westhill served as the top civil rights official at the United States Department of Agriculture. He is also a member of our Civil Rights Practice Group Executive Committee, which is sponsoring today's event. For our audience, if you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. You can enter questions at any time, and our presenter will take those questions towards the end of the program as time permits. But again, you can enter those questions at any time in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. With that, thank you for being with us today. Devin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Evelyn, and uh, uh, thanks to the audience for being here. I think this is an important uh, topic, one that hopefully um, I and the, the audience will learn a lot about. Uh, as Evelyn said, I'm sorry to say um, one of our presenters, Morgan Williams, uh, who's general counsel for the National Fair Housing Alliance, couldn't join us uh, or hasn't been able to join us yet. Uh, if he does join us, then we'll try to bring him into the conversation. Uh, but instead, this is going to be a little bit of a, a dialogue, I think, between Paul and me. Uh, Paul may have some uh, introductory remarks that he's prepared that he'd like to uh, launch into. But other than that, we will uh, go back and forth. I have a set of questions I'm already interested in having uh, Paul uh, hear, hearing uh, Paul's response to. Uh, but this is going to be especially important to the audience as well. It's a good opportunity to engage. There will be um, uh, lots of time for that. Uh, but if we don't get questions, then you'll get some of your time back and we'll release Paul uh, so they can get back to client matters. Um, uh, so thank, I thank the Federalist Society for holding this. I um, want to thank Paul for being here. Uh, and it's a real privilege for me um, to have an opportunity to talk with Paul about this uh, on a Federalist Society program. Um, what are we talking about? Uh, so in June, uh, President Biden's Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, uh, um, proposed to rescind a Trump administration uh, disparate impact rule designed to implement the Fair Housing Act. Now, disparate impact being the concept that uh, a policy that leads to, say, uh, racial imbalances are presumptively illegal, even though uh, the policy or practice is non-discriminatory itself, a sort of uh, unintentional discrimination. Uh, in place of that rule, HUD wants to reinstate the 2013 discriminatory effect standard because the 2013 rule, quote, uh, better states Fair Housing Act jurisprudence and is more consistent with the Fair Housing Act's remedial purposes. Um, I think legally speaking, the 2013 rule has remained in effect, but uh, uh, the way it, uh, you know, the, the, the burden or the concern for, uh, uh, for disparate impact liability uh, was, you know, lesson to a degree under the Trump administration um, and likely it's going to change the way people uh, uh, interact with um, um, you know the new rule. So let me introduce Paul. Paul, uh, please just launch into any remarks that you've had um, prepared and then we'll try to just have a dialogue and, and, and tease out some of the important aspects of this movement by HUD. Uh, Paul Compton is a founding partner of Compton Jones Drescher a law practice based in Birmingham, Alabama, that focuses on transactional and regulatory matters for clients in the real estate, financial services, and community bank industries. Paul's practice especially involves affordable housing and tax credit supported community development projects. He is currently a member of the Housing Advisory Council of the Bipartisan Policy Center. From 2018 to 2020, Paul served as General Counsel of the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development in Washington, D.C. In that capacity, he also served on the Federal Housing Administration Mortgage Review Board and Mortgage Risk Review Council. Before Paul's service at HUD, he was a partner and member of the managing board of Bradley Arendt Bolt Cummings LLP in his Birmingham office. Paul's a graduate of the University of Virginia School of Law and the University of Alabama. He attended the London School of Economics and Political Science and is a Truman Scholar. Um, with that uh, being teed up, 
uh, and introducing Paul. Let me turn now to you, Paul, uh, if you have any uh, initial remarks you'd like to make. Yeah, well, well uh, Devin, I guess perhaps what would be um, most helpful um, to our audience is to kind of recount a little bit of, of, of the history as to how we got to where we are. And, and I'll try to do my best to, uh, to summarize the 2013 rule, um, which, which uh, I, I had, uh, Morgan and I had talked about, and he, he was initially gonna talk about that. So uh, frankly, I, I, I didn't focus a lot of my um, uh, efforts on, on doing that because Morgan could ably uh, do that. But let's, let's go back, take a walk back through memory lane uh, for uh, disparate impact. And so what we're talking about here is Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And so it was adopted uh, a few months after Title VII, which is essentially equal employment opportunity. And so while the statutes are similar, they're not exactly the same. Uh, in Griggs, uh, a decision in the late 1960s, the Supreme Court held that there was a disparate impact cause of action under Title VII, but until inclusive communities in 2015, the Supreme Court had never ruled that there was a disparate impact cause of action under Title VIII, the Fair Housing Act. And so that's an important backdrop. And one of the things that you'll hear me keep coming back to is we really have to take inclusive communities as the bedrock of what you try to decide in terms of giving guidance uh, to all the constituencies about what disparate impact means uh, in fair housing. And there's, there's a lot of tendency to analogize to Title VII, and some of that is certainly valid. Um, but uh, I think from my perspective, that's not the whole story. So let's go back again. So we have Griggs uh, under Title VII, but uh, various courts held in various contexts that uh, the, this is lower courts, that there was disparate impact uh, under Title VIII as well. However, the, the executive branch had never taken a written position on this. The Reagan administration, at least in court briefs, said there is no disparate impact uh, under uh, Title VIII. And indeed, the language of the two statutes is different enough that there was something of a case to be made that there did not exist under Title VIII disparate impact. So we go forward to um, the Clinton administration in 1994, uh, set up an interagency task force on fair lending. And as part of that announced a policy position that said there is disparate impact under the Fair Housing Act. And so that's where things really rested uh, until we go forward uh, into 2011, at which time there was a case called Magner v. Gallagher. And Magner was out of St. Paul, uh, Minnesota. And as uh, Justice Alito uh, kind of famously said, it was a case about whether landlords had to kill rats. Uh, it was um, a local ordinance that imposed what were perceived to be stringent standards for quality on landlords. A group of landlords filed suit uh, in Magner saying that these standards caused them to significantly increase rents and increasing rents had a disparate impact on persons in protected classes, principally African-Americans, uh, uh, under the Fair Housing Act. And therefore, the city ordinance requiring, among other things, rats to be killed had disparate impact. In this case, um, the, the Eighth Circuit upheld that disparate impact uh, cause of action, and the case wound its way uh, to the United States Supreme Court. Well, uh, the Obama administration and HUD were very afraid that this was not a good case uh, for a first impression of disparate impact. But to bolster the case, they proposed what became the 2013 HUD disparate impact rule, literally just 
weeks after the Magner case received cert. But I think it's crucial. And one of the things that at least I learned in Washington is don't pay too much attention to what they say, pay a lot of attention to what they do. And in this case, everyone's saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's disparate impact. It's always been around. It's here, it's here. What they did though was the Department of Justice uh, under um, the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, Tom Perez, who's now head of the DNC, or at least recently was head of the DNC, um, struck a deal with the city of St. Paul, which was the, the appellant or had sought cert uh, in the Magner case and said, well, we've got this other case where you may be liable for several hundred million dollars. It's a key to end case. Don't really remember what it was all about. But the Department of Justice said, you drop your Supreme Court appeal in the disparate impact matter, and we'll make this key TAM go away. And that's, in fact, exactly what happened. And so the Magner case was mooted. But the HUD regulation that it had spurred, you know, was on its own path. And lo and behold, just two years later, another case concerning disparate impact under Title VIII gets cert called Mount Holly versus Mount Holly Gardens or, or something like that. It's a township in New Jersey. And what the township had done is there was a blighted, what it at least said was a blighted neighborhood in, in a portion of the township. And they wanted to engage in revitalization, gonna exercise eminent domain, build new houses, and at least some members of the local community group said, we don't like this. It was, again, a disproportionately majority minority community. And they filed a lawsuit, among other things, at saying this is disparate impact. Once again, goes up. Third Circuit says, yes, this is disparate impact. And so um, it finds its way to the Supreme Court. Now, as you might expect, what Mr. Perez had done in the prior administration had been somewhat controversial, had been the subject of congressional hearings and other things. However, at the same time, the HUD rule had, had percolated along and actually got finalized in response to the Mount Holly uh, case. And the Department of Justice, again, under the Obama administration, took the position that the HUD rule was dispositive and answered everything that was needed in Mount Holly. But again, watch what they're doing, not what they're saying, is that that case got dismissed too. This time, not through the Department of Justice, but in fact, and, and I wish Morgan was here, I wouldn't pick on him behind his back, but uh, the National Fair Housing Alliance and George Soros' Open Societies Foundation uh, helped financially and otherwise, reach a settlement. And once again, that disparate impact case was mooted. But by this time, the 2013 rule was in fact in place. So then we go forward to 2015 and inclusive communities. And finally, a case sticks, goes um, uh, to judgment. It's a 5-4 decision, vigorous dissents by Justice Alito and Justice Thomas. Justice Kennedy wrote for the majority. And, and in it, while he noted the existence of the HUD regulation, the opinion really didn't either adopt it or say this is not it. And in fact, there are certain elements that you could say are consistent, but there certainly was a lot in inclusive communities that isn't present uh, in the 2013 rule. So that's where we kind of landed. Um, the uh, HUD under Secretary Carson, we believed that it was necessary to rework the 2013 rule to be consistent with inclusive communities, to add safeguards, those were Justice Kennedy's words, and also to limit the application of disparate impact to the heartland of discrimination or anti-discrimination treatment. And so we went about that in what we thought was a pretty methodical way. 
uh, we uh, in 2018 uh, issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking and saw comment broadly. The substantial majority said that indeed the 2013 rule did not follow as you would expect for a case that came two years later uh, that didn't adopt the rule, that they really weren't consistent. So to fast forward in 2019, uh, HUD proposed uh, a new disparate impact rule that at least was our intention and our and my belief followed very closely inclusive communities, fleshed out some concepts in it, uh, and then that went forward and was to be finalized in the fall of 2020. Just a few days before the rule was to go into effect, the district court in Massachusetts enjoined nationally the application of the rule. And, you know, not to be too pejorative, the, the, the court's uh, opinion was, well, it really liked the 2013 rule better. Uh, it, it didn't really go to the elements of the Administrative Procedures Act, didn't suggest that the rules hadn't been followed, just said, don't really like the rule. And there was a national injunction, as some of you may recall, uh, six weeks or so later, there happened to be an election. Uh, and by the time the appeals were filed. Um, a new administration uh, was in office and dismissed the appeal of the injunction against HUD's 2020 rule. And so I, I guess where that leaves us uh, is that there uh, is uh, still a case with a preliminary injunction, uh, but no political appetite to do anything about it. And so in response to that, if we go forward, um, on the first day in office, President Biden uh, issued executive orders, among other things, um, uh, seeking equity in various uh, program areas. And that was taken as direction to HUD uh, to reinstate a broader view of disparate impact. And uh, in the summer of 2021, uh, HUD uh, proposed such a rule. And so that's where uh, we stand today. And that rule uh, is verbatim simply readopting the 2013 rule, which I guess in some respects, as Devin alluded to, never exactly went away since the court had enjoined um, the 2020 rule. So when we refer to the 2013 rule, we're referring to the rule that was the rule in 2013 and is now proposed to be uh, the rule once again in a more formal way, uh, which right. would uh, undo uh, the two years of rulemaking um, that went forward in the Trump administration. So Devin, with that, I've talked way too long. I told <laughs> you I've been in federal service. I, I can talk a long time and say nothing. On, on the one hand, you've been in the federal service. On the other, you're a lawyer. I get it. We like to hear ourselves talk, Paul. Um, I'm going to try not to talk too much, but I want to pick up on something that you said. I think that was a really important uh, primer for the discussion. Um, you mentioned that um, one of the goals, and there's basically two, I thought I heard you say, one of the goals of, of writing that 2020, what ended up being the 2020 rule, um, was that you wanted to limit disparate impact in the 2020 rule. Um, why would you want to do that, right? Proponents of the disparate impact rule uh, or disparate impact in general say, well, look, it drives business innovation, fuels healthy regional markets, uh, critical to ensuring that the Fair Housing Act remains a tool to promote an open and equitable housing market. Um, it can uh, uh, create restraints on um, uh, problems that can be caused by innovative uh, technological developments like AI, machine learning. Why would you want to limit the disparate impact rule? Why was that a goal? Well, uh, you know, at the outset, Devin, the, the, the point wasn't to limit the disparate impact rule. The point was to have a rule and guidance that whether you are um, 
you know, a mortgage borrower, whether you were a tenant, whether you were a landlord, or anyone else involved in the broad swath um, of industries that the Fair Housing Act covers, is it so that people would know what the rules are? Uh, I do find it ironic. I have heard the statement that uh, the new rule is uh, there to encourage innovation. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of, yeah, we're we're from the government. We're here to help. Um, not not sure how many times we have uh, seen um, government policies that increase uncertainty uh, and liability be called drivers of innovation. I, I, I think it will certainly be innovative for trial lawyers. Um, so uh, let me leave that part uh, there. But our purpose was not to limit disparate impact. In appropriate instances, under the court's guidance, that's the law of the land, it's to be applied. I think it's very interesting, at least as far as I'm aware and, and through my tenure, HUD had never brought a civil rights action under the Fair Housing Act that was premised solely on disparate impact. Now, disparate impact was frequently tied to disparate treatment. Uh, but the department itself, to my knowledge, had not brought a solo case that was only based on disparate impact. Um, so I, I think uh, the other side of this is when, when we looked at cases and we looked at research on cases of disparate impact cases that had actually gone to judgment across the United States, only about 20% of those were successful. And, you know, as a lawyer, you would say, you know, if people are willing to take things, you know, all, all the way, you really should kind of find something that's closer to 50-50. You know, there was, you know, but, uh, you know, 80% of the cases were losing. And one of the things that we said to ourselves is plaintiffs need better guidance on what's going to be successful because plaintiffs are wasting a lot of time and money bringing cases that aren't successful. Uh, we, we really wanted to have rules where it was more uh, of a toss up, that if, if you've got good rules, you know, we should see more equitable results uh, in the cases. So that, that's kind of interesting to me. You, so that plaintiffs know what the rules are, that uh, you know, you're, you're saving them uh, money and time, resources, et cetera, by not taking, not, bringing cases that, that are going to be unsuccessful, right? What, on, on, on the other side of this, the, the lenders and, you know, why, from what I understand, I could be wrong about this, um, um, to what extent and why are major lenders supporting the, the, the 2013 disparate uh, impact rule? The new oil. Well, I, I, I guess to, to quote a, a, a famous patriot from, from the revolution, is that they would um, uh, prefer to pay tribute uh, rather than, um, uh, you know, protect their own interest. Uh, that at least paying tribute is what they view as their own interest. I, and to harken back to, you know, what what they say and what they do, uh, I, I can assure you, at least in every case that I've seen where a major institutions been sued for disparate impact, they vigorously defend themselves. Uh, the the case in point is Bank of America in the Miami, I believe it's uh, Miami or Miami Gardens uh, decision, which was its own uh, type of disparate impact case, although really uh, focused more on proximate cause, which, by the way, um, the 2013 rule says absolutely nothing uh, about proximate cause, um, again, because the jurisprudence that led to that um, you know, antedated it by, you know, a, a number of years. So, um, yeah, they, they, they say that, but, you know, Devin, if, if, if I were to be a cynical person, I would say, well, just uh, none of them want to um, have a target painted on them as, as the first defendant in a new disparate impact case. Cynical or just realistic, uh, Paul. Um, could, could you go into a little bit of detail uh, about, what I understand to be the five prong test of the uh, of the 2020 rule, there there's 
the 2020 rule is basically replacing the three prong test of the 2013 uh, rule with a five prong test, right? Well, I, I, I think, you know, the, there was some talk that, that it's a five prong test. I don't, I don't really think that that is the best way of describing it. But, uh, you know, but before we leave what other institutions, you know, major institutions have done, I, I uh, one of the things that I learned in my time at HUD is, is HUD is fundamentally its own very large financial institution. HUD through the FHA makes more loans uh, to persons in protected classes than any other lender in America. And one of the things that I found very ironic is that many of the major institutions who were at least vocally supporting a uh, different view of disparate impact were exactly the same institutions that were refusing to participate in FHA lending because they said there was too much liability. Uh, so again, watch what they do, not what they say. So the, the largest program providing mortgage financing uh, to African-Americans and others in, in protected classes in America, many of those large institutions uh, did not participate in because they said there was too much liability. So, gotcha. Uh, yeah, but but to, go, to go to, to you know, what the 2020 rule was, was trying to do is that we took really seriously the fact that not once, not twice, but three times, uh, Justice Kennedy, writing for the majority, said that for a business or governmental practice or policy uh, to be subject to um, a claim for disparate impact, it needed to be artificial, arbitrary, or unnecessary. And we really took that as the touchstone and one that could, as a qualitative matter, be something that courts and juries could understand, which is, uh, you know, said another way is, is what a business is doing that is excluding persons in protected classes. Um, it, is it really a pretext or otherwise, is it just stupid? You know, it is that what, you know, to take an example uh, in New Orleans, there was a requirement. At one time, you could only live in a neighborhood if you were related by blood to other people who lived there. You know, that's just kind of stupid. And, you know, that would be exactly the sort of thing that, you know, I think would be subject um, uh, to being struck down uh, under the 2020 rule. And so that's where um, we really focused is at that threshold level of asking, is it artificial, arbitrary, and unnecessary? And second, placing the burden of demonstrating that on the plaintiff, as it ordinarily is in American jurisprudence, rather than under the 2013 rule, essentially the defendant is required to prove the negative. That is, there's nothing else I could have done that would have achieved my ends, you know, without, you know, causing the disparate statistical information. And in that respect, um, the 2013 rule, as compared to the 2020 rule, um, does not take into effect that that other thing you might do might be much more expensive or much more cumbersome, um, uh, you know, to carry out than what the original policy was. Justice Kennedy went out of his way to talk about the importance of a vibrant and dynamic free enterprise system where essentially courts aren't second guessing decisions. And I think that the real world impact of what disparate impact can do is really look at Mount Holly Gardens. For 10 years, a, a blight removal project was stuck in the courts because no one knew exactly what the rules are. Yeah. Well, um, 
Paul, you and I have been talking now for about half an hour. We could be putting our audience to sleep. They could be excited about asking us some questions and, and getting answers to things that they are actually uh, really interested in. So I'm just gonna make a call out to the audience to say, uh, get your questions in. Uh, we'll take them in the order in which uh, we receive them. Um, but before we get to uh, any audience questions, if we have them, I wanted to ask another question uh, of you, Paul. And, and that is... When, uh, De Devin, when am I going to get to ask you questions? I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let, let, let me ask about one of the fundamental goals of uh, sort of the, the disparate impact theory uh, in housing. Right, perpetu you know, avoiding the perpetuation of segregation. Do efforts to avoid perpetuating segregation mean that new HUD supported housing should only be permitted in high income areas and gentrification of low income areas should be encouraged? If not, why not? Well, and, and I think that that's, um, you know, in, in government, we, sh we should always be sensitive to unintended consequences, or, or perhaps they are intended. Um, but in, in that respect, if, if you look at, um, frankly, the inclusive communities, what the cause of action underlying that was, was that was a lawsuit um, by a community group against the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs that said it wasn't putting enough low-income housing tax credit apartments in high-income areas. That, that was what the, the suit was about. And, and it alleged that if you looked at the statistics, that um, more uh, line tech apartments were put in lower income communities than higher income communities. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's a possibility of, of a lot of debate about the, the wisdom of those things, um, you know, whether you put them in high income communities or low income communities. But what we see um, carrying through in, in other um, uh, policies, such as uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing and HUD site and neighborhood standards, which also uh, have this um, uh, policy goal of, of putting um, affordable housing in high income neighborhoods, which I personally believe is a great thing. I, I think that every community should have the ability to have affordable housing there and there shouldn't be arbitrary, artificial or unnecessary impediments, which often come about through zoning laws, or the way that building codes are enforced uh, to do that. But the way that this is currently being administered is what it effectively means is that you can't put affordable housing in lower income communities. Here, uh, I, I've lived in, in, except for a few years in Washington, I've lived in Birmingham, Alabama all my life. Birmingham's divided into a series of, of neighborhoods and Birmingham's a majority minority city, has had an African-American mayor since 1979. And what we find is that only 5% of the neighborhoods in the city of Birmingham are actually eligible to receive HUD assistance for housing because they're deemed not to be high, in, high opportunity neighborhoods. That's just wrong to me. That is old fashioned redlining. We're once again doing the same thing that happened in 1938. And it was wrong then and it's wrong now except now we just have a story about, you know, why that's a good thing. I, I don't think it is. I think that we need to make affordable housing accessible across the board. And I think that the way that disparate impact and the policies that kind of have their intellectual underpinnings in it, at least as currently described, uh, whether it is inclusive communities or, or you can go back, that's the same theory that was in the Mount Holly case. Uh, is, and, and in some ways, it's the reverse of, of Magner, uh, it is that, um, that that's just bad policy, bad for America and inconsistent with what our values should be. Yeah. yeah, I think that goes to the heart of why so many people really do uh, oppose disparate impact theory uh, itself. Um, but let me, uh, let me turn to a couple of questions I see here in the queue. Not sure when... Uh, when this first question came in, because I think we might have 
gone over this, maybe not uh, clearly enough. Uh, I think it's important to, to uh, say the names of folks who are asking questions as well. This is Clay Halverson. Um, please explain what each version of the disparate impact rule says. What's the difference basically between the two proposed rules? What are the, what are, what are the main differences between the two proposed rules? Yeah, um, in that, you know, I, I would say that uh, a couple of those I, I have touched on already uh, is, is that first, um, you know, we really took seriously Justice Kennedy's admonition about focusing on policies that are artificial, arbitrary, and unnecessary. And so we really um, set that out. Second, the court um, encouraged there to be prompt uh, resolution of cases that were not meritorious at an early stage. And so we tried to set up a process by which that could happen. And that was largely in the way in the 2020 rule that the, the burdens of production and persuasion were established. As I mentioned earlier in the 2013 rule, on the other hand, um, it really places the burden ultimately on uh, the defendant to, to, to prove that there was just nothing else they could do uh, in, this in the, the case at hand. Um, the, the second thing, or, or the third thing I should say, um, is the role of, of statistics. And that really turns on the word predictably. The 2013 rule uh, uses that. Whereas the Inclusive Community uh, Court was very clear in saying merely a difference in statistics uh, doesn't make a case. You know, one of my uh, favorite sayings, uh, which I'm not sure if it was uh, Mark Twain or Disraeli, I've heard it attributed to both, but there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. Uh, and so I think that we have to be cautious about that. And the 2020 rule uh, uh, tried to um, reflect that. Um, then, uh, as I, I think I also mentioned, um, there is the, the issue of proximate cause. Um, the Inclusive Communities Court um, spoke at some length about the necessary of finding uh, cause. I don't think they use proximate cause. I think that's what a, we would typically refer to that as, as the link between the complaint of policy and the resulting harm. Um, then the 2013 rule says nothing about appropriate remedies. The 2020 rule was very express, again, following inclusive communities, that the remedies really should not be uh, damages uh, or racial targets, but instead should be limiting, limited to equitable actions to remove the offending practice, that is, if, if your policy, um, to again use the New Orleans example, is to say, uh, says that you have to be related by blood to live in the neighborhood, is, is that that should be struck. Um, and then, um, I, I, again, as I mentioned, um, there is uh, the issue about where we place the burdens of, of, of persuasion. And, and our belief that um, that really should, should rest as it traditionally does on the planet. Thank you very much, Paul. And I have another question here from the audience, but before I get to that, I'm gonna take the moderator's prerogative again and, and pepper you with another one of my uh, questions. You mentioned statistics on a couple of occasions. Um, and so if we're going to have disparate impact uh, uh, here, um, how much discrimination should be permitted under disparate impact regulations? What is the statistical standard for what a disparate impact is? 5%, 10%, 50%? Well, as, as, as Justice Stewart said, you know, I know it when I see it. Uh, and, and, and that's really a bad way to run a rule. And, and that is what the, the 2020, excuse me, the 2013 rule uh, simply uh, is, is silent about that. And, and, and it says, that uh, effectively everything is suspect unless you have a legally sufficient justification. And I would footnote whatever that means. Um, we felt 
uh, in, in looking at the 2020 rule that um, a, a numerical standard was not appropriate and probably would be unconstitutional uh, because it, it effectively would, would be um, creating some sort of quota or ratio. And so once again, that's where we fell back to the qualitative standard of, you're gonna hear those three words again, artificial, arbitrary, or unnecessary. Those really resound with people, lawyers and judges and, and members of the jury, you, you can get that. If instead you start talking about statistical intervals of confidence and you know that this much is okay and that much is not, we're really arbitrarily drawing uh, lines that have no basis in, in the law. Remember, we're, we're extrapolating this out of, you know, essentially two words, because of. And um, what we would find is what I think a lot of us recognize in, in real life is there, there's a lot of ran, randomness uh, to life and other things. And uh, you, you, unless you're really trying hard to get to a specific ratio, you rarely do. And the one thing, again, the Kennedy court was perfectly clear about is steering to a ratio is neither what they desired and instead would be constitutionally problematic at best. And, and so I think that if you even take measures such as credit scores that you know, are meticulously designed to try to avoid um, having a discriminatory effect. If you take those, I don't care whether you set a cut line at 780 or 320, at every cut line, if you did something lower, you would have less discriminatory effect. And so, you know, the, the answer really is that we've got disparate impact all around us in almost every scenario you can think of. And so the question is not whether disparate impact is wrong, but, but what types are wrong. And so it's not really even what amount, it's what types. And we come back, at least in the, the HUD that I worked for, for Ben Carson, and we said, what we want to do is we don't want people you know, using this as a pretext for discriminating, and we don't want people doing stupid stuff. Sure. Sure. Thanks so much for that, Paul. I appreciate it. I'm going to get to another one of our, uh, uh, our participants' uh, questions. This is from Braden Busek. Uh, and I think you teed up the, the, the question well. Uh, do you foresee potential for litigation? Uh, when is a case ripe and, and who can be a plaintiff, presumably in suing, suing HUD? Through the roof. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I think that, um, you know, un, under this standard, we're, we're going to see lots and lots of litigation to drive, um, you know, parties' uh, policy preferences um, in, in a host of areas. And, and you know, I, 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 I won't be surprised if in a few years we don't see another of these cases uh, trickle back up Um to the Supreme Court, and obviously it, it has a, at least as of today, you know, uh, perhaps a different outlook than would have, than was present in 2015. Do, do you have, do um, uh, you have any thoughts on when a case is right or who a plaintiff might be? Oh, uh, you know, Devin, I, I spend my days trying to uh, get affordable housing finance, so uh, <laughs> I can't say too much about plaintiffs and defendants. I, I, I know some good litigators. Fair. Okay, good. I think we've answered that question. Let me move on to another I see that's coming for us. Um, and again, I'm posing these to you. You're the real expert here. Um, if there's anything that comes in that I might be able to chime in on, I, I will. Uh, this is from, uh, I, hope I hope I'm not butchering this, Batia Zare. Uh, is there any administrative guidance on when an application of a claim of disparate impact risks overreaching into the area of a taking? Is there any administrative guidance on that? I think the shortest and most correct answer about administrative guidance is no. 
that I'm not aware of, of any uh, anything that would touch on that point. Obviously, uh, for instance, the Mount Holly case kind of had aspects of, of both disparate impact and takings. Uh, what, what, the, what the township had proposed there uh, was the use of eminent domain. So, you know, you, you, you can get tangled up in, in more than one line of, of, of jurisprudence. Okay. Um, I don't see another question now. I'll make one final ask for questions. We're coming, uh, we're getting low on time now, about 13 minutes remaining uh, before we have to do a hard stop. We could get out earlier, we'll see, um, but we're, we're not quite done yet because I'm not done uh, with you, Paul. Uh, let, let me ask maybe- uh, my you're, you're, I don't like it when you smile like that when you say <laughs> Let me ask uh, maybe my final question. Uh, and then if we have any additional questions from the audience, um, I will turn to those as we begin to wrap things up. Um, you know, I'm sort of interested in one of the questions I was asked in terms of litigation and, and so forth. There's been a lot uh, that that you could you could sue over, and people have um, with uh, policies and, and and activities of the Biden administration. Um, it's kind of interesting to me. You know, I, I think you, you touched on this, but I'd like to maybe uh, hear a little bit more about it. Um, where does the Biden administration's focus on promoting equity? as reflected in executive order uh, 13985 fit with disparate impact. There's this whole of, of uh, equity, whole of government equity agenda that the Biden administration has. Can you explain a little bit uh, uh, more, you know, how that agenda uh, fits in with disparate impact? Yeah, well, I, I, obviously, you know, disparate impact, I think, can be the legal tool uh, to, um, to, to try to um, uh, reduce what are alleged uh, inequities, uh, you know, as I might uh, also cynically say, until we're all equally poor, um, is that uh, you know it, it is it is no surprise that that was a day one policy because. Uh, particularly in its 2013 form, to, to harken back to what I said about Justice Stewart, it, it means what I mean it to mean. And, and if I am um, sitting in, in the executive branch and have hundreds of lawyers uh, at my disposal who don't cost me any more uh, to, to litigate this versus that, uh, and, and I can uh, pursue a defendant with relatively unlimited resources under a nebulous standard, uh, I can usually exact uh, some, you know, uh, at, at least to my way of thinking, uh, uh, favorable uh, settlement results. Let, let I think me... that's one of the reasons that we kind of at the end see fairly I mean, oddball cases hit hit the Supreme Court because major players have too much to lose from litigating, and that's one of the problems with the 2013 rule. Is all you know is that you're behind if you're a defendant is that you're behind the eight ball. Yeah, we see that in a lot of areas. Let Let me ask what appears to be the final audience question. Uh, and it comes from Luke Wake. Uh, would the 2013 rule call into question single family housing zoning? Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, given not a particularly unusual set of facts that could happen. Well, uh, that's a that's a good, easy answer there. Uh, Paul, I don't see any other questions from the audience. I've really given you a run uh, during this program. Um, I want to give you a softball, and that is, is there anything else that you might want to bring up that we haven't talked about yet, uh, just to sort of round out this conversation, or do you want to recap anything? Uh, last uh, last words. Uh, well, goodness, Devin, I wish I'd known I was going to have a softball. This, this is Those not- Those are the tough a, ones. <laughs> yeah, no, this, you know, I, I guess what I would say is, is just in general, and in this area and, and many in, involved in, in civil rights is, is that I, I think that there needs to be a, a distinction between what appears to be 
uh, you know, things that permit justice in, in a very narrow sense and policies that improve justice in, in a broader way. And I am, um, I'm a houser. Uh, I believe that we don't have enough housing in some communities and we don't have enough quality housing in other communities. And it, it just really hurts me to see policies that I think make that problem worse uh, and that are supported or, or if you question those policies uh, is that you can often get a kind of a vituperative response that you're just an uncaring person. It's like, no, no. Um, I, I believe that those policies are, are working against more people than they're working for. And so yeah. I, I would, I would just encourage people to, uh, again, you know, think about the unintended consequences of some of these things. Um, you know, I, I had, I'll just close with this. I, I, I had a friend, frankly, a former uh, uh, colleague who is working with a historically black university who's wanting to build some neighborhood housing where professors and other staff at the university can, can live. And um, it, the, the, the university is in a, you know, lower end neighborhood uh, that needs revitalization. And, and um, we're just dead in the water for doing it because of site and neighborhood standards. And it, it just, it's worse than bothers me. Well, so sage wisdom and thoughts uh, to close us out. Really appreciate this conversation, Paul. This was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Uh, I hope our audience enjoyed it. I want to thank you again for participating. Uh, thank the audience as well for being here. And uh, thank the Federalist Society and Evelyn for helping us put this together. Thanks very much. Thank yeah, you. On behalf thank, of thank you all. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Uh, wow. Thank you for our audience for participating as well. And if you have any comments or questions, please send them in by email at info at fed-soc.org. Thank you to our, our speaker and our moderator for an excellent presentation. And until next time, we are adjourned. Thank you.